So we're reading in book two, the book of the traveler of the worlds. We're following King Aswapati in his exploration of all the planes of existence in ascending order from matter to subtle matter to the planes of life and mind and above. He's searching for the power, the principle that will be able to turn our earthly life into a divine life in the material world on earth. That is the power which he is searching for. And the canto we are reading just now is canto four, the kingdoms of the little life. In the early sections of this canto, Sri Aurobindo has given a very poignant picture of how the wonderful divine goddess of life has descended into matter and been swallowed up in the inertia and unconsciousness of matter so that she's like a lost child and only slowly, slowly will she be able to reveal some of her divine gifts. So in this canto, apart from two or three uh, introductory sections at the beginning, he shows us three stages of the development of life, of physical life on earth. First of all, the most primitive, imaginable, single-celled creatures who hardly seem to be living beings, more like slimes or moles or amoebas or something like that. If we saw those creatures and we thought that, oh, this is life on Earth, we would feel, uh, what use is this? But King Aswapati, with his spiritual foresight, is able to see that this is a very important stage in the emergence of life in matter. <coughs> and having described that, Shobindo describes to us next a more advanced level of life development, the animal kingdom, with all its very many varied forms and behaviors from uh, small to big to gigantic, and um, how there are they're included in that animal kingdom, there are even beings who look like human beings, but who are not yet human in their consciousness. He describes these beings to us. And then the third stage of the evolution of life in physical matter is where we are now. Um, a third creation. This is the beginning of the emergence of mind in these, uh, these living beings. So we reached page 147 and we stopped reading on line 556 with a description of these beings who may look like human beings or the beginnings of human beings but who are still animal in their consciousness. So I'm going to read on from there. All was dim sparkle on a foaming top. It whirled around a drifting shadow self on an inconscient flood of force in time. Then came the pressure of a seeing power that drew all into a dancing turbid mass circling around a single luminous point, 
center of reference in a conscious field, figure of a unitary light within. It lit the impulse of the half-sentient blood. Even an illusion gave of fixity, as if a sea could serve as a firm soil. That strange observing power imposed its sight. It forced on flux a limit and a shape. It gave its stream a lower narrow bank, drew lines to snare the spirit's formlessness. It fashioned the life mind of bird and beast the answer of the reptile and the fish, the primitive pattern of the thoughts of man. A finite movement of the infinite came winging its way through a wide air of time, a march of knowledge moved in nescience and guarded in the form a separate soul. Its right to be immortal it reserved, but built a wall against the siege of death and drew a hook to clutch eternity. A thinking entity appeared in space. A little ordered world broke into view where being had prison room for act and sight, a floor to walk, a clear but scanty range. An instrument personality was born and a restricted, clamped intelligence consented to confine in narrow bounds its seeking. It tied the thought to visible things, prohibiting the adventure of the unseen and the soul's tread through unknown infinities. A reflex reason, nature habits glass, illumine life to know and fix its field, accept a dangerous ignorant brevity and the inconclusive purpose of its walk and profit by the hours pre precarious chance in the allotted boundaries of its fate. A little joy and knowledge satisfied this little being tied into a knot and hung on a bulge of its environment. A little curve cut off in measureless space a little span of life in all vast time. You will start, Suresh. All was World. world, it whirled around. It whirled around the yeah, drifting shadow itself on an inconscient floor of force in time. Then came the pressure of a seeing power that drove all into a dancing, 
turbid, turbid. Tur turbid mass circling around a single luminous point, center of reference in a conscious field, figure of a unitary light within. Thank you. So in the early stages of this pro um, process of the emergence of individualized consciousness, mental consciousness, in living beings, he says, first, it's like uh, the surface of a sea, sparkling with phosphorescence. All was dim sparkle on a foaming top. That light is a little light of consciousness. Hmm? And that sparkle on this foaming top, this foam, it begins to circle around something that we could begin to think of as an individuality, a drifting shadow self. And it's floating on the surface of this unconscious flood of force, of energy, of material energy in time. Then came the pressure of a seeing power from above, from somewhere else is coming this pressure of some of a power that has the capacity for vision and which is able to insist on vision and consciousness. And that pressure <coughs> draws together this floating, foaming mass, sparkling mass, and gives it a center. <coughs> Drew everything into a dancing, turbid mass. It means it's uh, a bit muddy and dirty, dancing, but it's circling around a single luminous point. Perhaps this is the beginning of the conscious soul. That single luminous point becomes a center of reference for that particular mass. Center of reference in a conscious field. It's the center of a field of consciousness. And it's the figure or image, the representation of a light within, a unitary light, a light that unites and holds together all the different experiences and awarenesses. Marika. Yeah. Did it. Did it the impulse of the half sensual flood. Even an illusion came. Fixity. Fixity. As if a sea could serve as a firm soil. That strange observing power imposed its sight. It forced on flux a limit and a shape. It gave its stream a lower, narrow bank. Drew lines to snare the spirit's formlessness. It fashioned the life mind of bird and beast. The answer of the reptile and the fish. The primitive pattern the source of men. Thank you. So this figure of a unitary light within lights up an impulse, a direction in that half sentient flood, in that flow which is something like a sea, it's just flowing, 
but it has the capacity of at least some sense awareness. It's half sentient. Hmm? That um, unitary light within, which represents the center of that flow, even gives, Shobindo says it's an illusion, but anyway, it gives the impression and the feeling of something firm and fixed, as if that sea, that moving flow, could actually serve as a firm soil, a base for something to happen. And that strange observing power went on imposing its sight. It forced on that flux, on that flow, to find a limit, a borderline, and a particular shape. It gives to its stream, to its flow, a, a, a lower narrow bank, a kind of bed in which the, the stream flows. It drew lines to snare the spirit's formlessness. Spirit is formless, no? But this uh, seeing power, this kind of intelligence that is there, uh, starts to delimit out of that formlessness shapes and forms. In this way, it fashioned, it shaped and molded the life mind of bird and beast and animal, the answer, the response of the reptile and the fish, the primitive pattern of the thoughts of man. I think the biologists tell us that we have seven levels of brain, of, of conscious centers of conscious awareness in us. And uh, the most primitive one is the one here, the reptilian brain here, that gives the answer of the reptile and the fish. So he says that's the primitive pattern, the beginning what lays the basis for the beginning of our thought. And then something new happens. Would you like to read, sir? Yes. So, um, five, five, seven, six, a finite movement. Yeah. Finite movement of the infinite. Game meaning its way through a wide air of time, a march of knowledge moved in the science and guarded in the form of a guarded in the form a separate soul. Its right to be immortal it reserved, but built a wall against the siege of death and threw a hook to clutch eternity. Let's stop there. Hmm? Within the infinite, a defined movement, a movement that's limited, hmm? came, it comes from somewhere in the infinite, like a bird coming, its, winging its way through a wide air of time. So around this little being or these little beings, a march of knowledge the beginnings of knowledge began to move in all that nescience. It's not even ignorance yet. It's a state of not knowing. And that, uh, that finite movement guards, it protects in the form a separate soul. It's the beginning of individuality, individual consciousness. That beginning of soul, it says it reserves its right to be immortal. It's not 
immortal yet. It's keeping that possibility in reserve. But what it does is it builds a protective wall against the being, uh, around the being, against the siege of death, all the enemies and forces, destructive forces in the universe that are trying to dissolve it. And it even, it's as if it throws a kind of sky hook to catch hold of eternity. A thinking entity, a small being with the capacity of thought appeared in space. It's a very important step in evolution. Hmm? Yes. Question about line 575. Yes. Uh, of the thoughts of man. Hmm. Yes. And I understood you were talking about a reptile. Yes. Is that not a human being that is meant here? Yeah. It says that the way that the, that first way of thinking, which gave the answer of the reptile and the fish, acts as a kind of primitive, original template on which the thoughts of human beings have been built. Does it make sense? Hmm? Yeah. And if we if we observe very, very carefully our movements, we can see the action of that, those primitive patterns, even in our conscious awareness, or our not so conscious awareness. Hmm? A thinking entity appeared in space. It's a real step forward in the evolutionary, in the process of the evolution of life. Hmm? So that little thinking entity, it has a, uh, an awareness of its world. Alice, would you read please? Line, Line 800, uh, 584, a little ordered world. A little ordered world broke into view where being had prison room for act and sight, a floor to walk, a clear but scanty range. An instrument personality was born, and a restricted clamped intelligence consented to confine in narrow bounds its seekings. It tried, I tied. it tied the thought to visible things, prohibiting the adventure of the unseen and the soul's tread through unknown infinities. Yes. So the awareness of this first thinking entity encompasses a little range, a little ordered world. Some kind of order appears there, an awareness of order. And being, existence, that, that ordered world gives a space where being can act and see and move A clear but scanty range. It's limited. It's very. It's not enough. It's prison room. It's quite limited. Can I ask you something? Yes, Marek. Does he mean that maybe? Um, in the origin, every human being is like this. Uh, what has become us human beings, yeah. the, the origins of our consciousness, are like this. The, the, no differences. The, hmm? With 
no individual differences between them. Yeah. There must have been individual differences, but in general it's like this, that their, their range of awareness mm -hmm. is limited and... Um, there's for all. Hmm? There's for all of this. Yes. You imagine all those little beings, how much can they be aware of? Mm -hmm. But still, it's a very important beginning. And that is underlying the development of our consciousness. And what is meant by an instrument? Yes, an instrument personality that suggests that somebody or something is using this personality, this individuality with its differences no, from the others. So probably that is this seeing power which has not yet taken possession, full possession of the being, but which is influencing it from outside or above. And the, that intelligence is very restricted, limited, clamped. Clamped is when you can't move one way or the other. No? But it, somehow that intelligence accepts to be limited like that. To confine itself, to confine its seekings in these narrow boundaries. And it ties the thought to visible things. It's looking outward. It's not allowing this intelligence to float off into vague infinities. No, it's tying it to the physical world, to visible things. It's prohibiting the adventure of the unseen. That will come later. But for now, uh, I suppose the forms and the, the intelligence couldn't develop if it was too diffused, it gets uh, focused on these small points, prohibiting the adventure of the unseen and the soul's tread through unknown infinities. There is King Aswapati, he's seeing all this, but he himself is able to move, his soul is able to move through these unknown infinities. But he looks back and he sees these very early stages in the development of the little life. Would you like to read? A reflex reason. Yes. A reflex reason. Nature had its glass illumined life to know and fix its field. Accept a dangerous, ignorant gravity and the inconclusive purpose of its walk and profit by the hour's precarious chance in the allotted boundaries of its fate. A little joy and knowledge satisfied this little being tied into a knot and hung on a bulge of its environment, a little curve cut off in measureless space, a little span of life in all vast time. Mm, thank you. I think this is such a, a wonderful picture. Mm. Uh, hmm? I, I mean, the picture, the way it he makes you see this little uh, it's like when we were kids, we used to blow up balloons and then we'd uh, uh, separate off one little bit of the balloon. Mm -hmm. so it's as if the individual beings are like that. Little tiny balloons, they're still connected to the big balloon, but they're somehow distinct and separate. Mm -hmm. So they have a little individuality and separateness, a little curve cut off in measureless space. And they have a short life, a little space of life in all vast time. It's the development of the beginning of individuality. Why does he use the word bulge here? It's so interesting. Bulge. <laughs> 
There's the idea of curve of space being curved, no? like a balloon. <laughs> I think on Sunday we were reading a bit further on, and there it spoke about how space got hammered into a curve. No? He speaks about a reflex reason. It has some capacity of reflection, but maybe it's also automatic. You know, when you go to the doctor and he tests your reflexes, you don't have any control over it. It just, it just does it. But he says that's the mirror, the, gla the looking glass of nature's habit, habits. It reflects the habits of nature. But it does give some light. It allows light to know its field and to fix its field. This is my area of sight and knowledge. It illumined life to accept this dangerous, precarious, ignorant brevity, the shortness of its lifespan and all the threats it has to face and the inconclusive purpose of its walk. It has to move, it has to move around, but it's not clear why it's doing that, where it is going. But it can profit by the hour's precarious chance, the things that just pop up and then are gone again. <clears throat> it can profit from those opportunities in the allotted boundaries of its fate, this narrow range it is allowed. <clears throat> and this being, these individual beings, are satisfied with a little bit of delight and a little bit of knowledge, which probably we wouldn't even think of as knowledge, awareness, something like that. This little being tied into a knot, hung on the bulge of its environment, a little curve cut off in all that measureless space, a little span, a short span of life in all vast time. Does he also mean it still exists? Hmm. <laughs> Those little beings existed at that time. Whether how long that individuality persists, I, I can't say. Here it says just a little span of life. But the, the seeing power which is uh, pressing on all this, that is, uh, lasts much longer. May perhaps be even <coughs> infinite. Juliana, thank you. Would you read, please? I told myself that moment. I knew that story. But for this moment, and we came another story. Was he unmissionary to all transient things? It knew itself accurately of the moon. It asked no larger law. Loftier and it had no inward look, no outward gaze. Thank you. So, this little being has some capacity of thought, it can plan, there's some will, it can choose, but only for very, very small aims within a narrow scope, wasting unmeasured toil on transient things. Everything is a terrible effort for that little being to achieve anything. You know? 
and whatever it gains, it's transient, it passes away. It knew itself, it has some self-knowledge. It knew itself a creature of the mud, <coughs> belonging to the earth, of the earth earthy. And it doesn't wish for or ask for any larger law than that. No higher aim. It had no upward look, no inward look. Actually, it's forbidden no, to have an inward look. It has no upward gaze. Hmm? Shailen, hmm. in the line uh, 598, yes. In the allotted boundaries of its fate. Mm. So the fate for them also started by the time? Yes, I think they were more um, dominated by fate than we are, no? They were really limited by their environment and the circumstances around and everything. Mm. Fate means determinism, no? What the limits of the circumstances of your life. Mm. Fate is, you think it is only for human beings, is that fate and all, but for those small creatures... Yeah, they they also there. each had an individual fate. <coughs> Excuse me. He seems to say. Then he gives us a colorful image. Would you read, please? A backwards scholar on logic's rickety bench, indoctrinated by the erring sense. They took appearance for the face of God, for casual lights, the marching of the suns, for heavy a starry strip of doubtful blue. Aspects of being feigned to be the whole. There was a voice of busy interchange a marketplace of trivial thoughts and acts, a life soon spent, a mind the body's slave. Here seemed the brilliant crown of nature's work, and tiny egos took the world as means to save a while dwarf lusts and brief desires. In a death-closed passage saw life start and end as though a blind alley were creation's sign, as if for this the soul had covered birth. In the wonderland of a self-creating world and the opportunities of cosmic space. Yes. <coughs> so who is it here? What is it here? It is this thought. The thought was there, that planned, no? and that knows itself a creature of the mud. So he images that thought, that developing thought, as a, um, a rather stupid schoolboy, a backward scholar, sitting on, also on the back bench probably, on logic's rickety bench. That's what he has to sit and base himself on in his thought. It's not very reliable, that logic that he has to use. And his thought is indoctrinated by the erring sense, by all the information that the senses give, but they are giving us wrong information or misleading information. Hmm? So that thought sees all the appearances and accepts them. This is the face of God. This is reality. This is truth. This is how things are. It sees the marching of the suns, the wonderful stars above, but thinks they have no significance. They're just casual lights which happen to be there. It sees that starry strip of doubtful blue. Does it really exist? 
as heaven, the highest world. And for it, different aspects, appearances, figures of things are taken to be the whole. I don't see that these are only parts of the picture. And it seems that amongst these beings, there's a lot of communication. There was a voice of busy interchange, at least of sensations, maybe even of opinions, a marketplace of trivial thoughts and acts without much value or significance. The life is soon spent. The mind is slave to the body that it inhabits. At this point, this seems to be the, the supreme achievement of nature, the brilliant crown of nature's work. Tiny egos, all these tiny little beings, took, make use of the world around them to satisfy for a little while their tiny little desires, their dwarf lusts. They seem to be aware that they will die. Their life is a death-closed passage. That's the beginning and the end of life. As if a blind alley. You know a blind alley, you, you turn into a little street and you can't get out of it. You can only turn around and go back. As though a blind alley were creation's sign, the mark of this creation, as if for this the soul has coveted birth, has chosen birth in this wonderland of a self-creating world and the opportunities of cosmic space. Sri Aurobindo reminds us that the soul chooses to take birth in the world. So for what? For some, some restricted, limited, ego-centered life like this? Can that be the be-all and end-all? For a time it might seem that this is the ultimate achievement of nature, but it can't be. What is the meaning of sate? To say to, it's more than satisfy, it's to stuff yourself so much that you can't take any more. <laughs> it's connected with satisfy. It's to say it. Okay. Torn. What means coveted? Coveted. To covet something it means to intensely desire something. So, was it for this that the soul <laughs> has embarked on this adventure of unconsciousness? <clears throat> this creature passionate only to survive. Fettered. Is passionate, is that uh, Sorry? an attractive passion, is that an attractive this creature passionate only yes that's its only uh, the only thing that it cares intensely about is to survive hmm? with no wide range unto the body's needs and pants and joys this fire grown by its fuel's death and used by what it sees and made its own it gathered and grew and gave itself to none. Only it hoped for greatness in its den. And pleasure and victory in small fields of power. And conquest of life room for self and king. And animal limited by its feelings. It knew not 
the immortal in its house. It had no greater need of cause to live. Yes. Fettered means chained to. Puny thoughts, weak, tiny thoughts with no wide range. It's chained to the needs and pains and joys of the body. There's, it has an energy, it's a fire, and it grows, but it grows by devouring. It, it increases by what it seizes and makes its own, what it assimilates, takes into itself. So it's always gathering and growing, but it doesn't give itself. This is a self-centered movement. Its only hope is for greatness in its den, in its animal home. It wants pleasure and victory in small fields of power. It wants to conquer life space for itself and its close relatives. It's an animal limited by its feeding space. It's fettered, it's tied like a goat uh, to a post. No, it can't go any further than its feeding space. This being is not aware that within it is the immortal, that there's an immortal being and possibility living in this house of the body. Because of that, it has no greater, deeper cause to live than just to survive as well as it can, as successfully as it can. Uh, this is the reality hmm. of the world. In so far as we are still animals, yes. But we have got much higher possibilities. We have, yeah, but we do we use it? Yeah, that's that's so, a, so today if we have seven billion approximately human beings on this planet. Yes. Out of seven billion 6.9 billion might be still living the life which he is describing yes. as a primitive life, right? Isn't it? Where they I, live for... I have a slightly more optimistic view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm astonished how widespread the use of reason is in the human race. We may not use our reason the most uh, effective or intelligent way, but uh, for, we can see from television interviews with representatives of primitive tribes from the Amazon or deep in the uh, swamps of Sudan, uh, these people can see and think and express their feelings. You know? And they look around at the world and they... So I think um, the, the next development, <laughs> you know, of the... First of all, the little mind. We don't come to it just yet. Sri Aurobindo is going to leave us here with the little life. We'll, have, we'll go on exploring the life worlds for six more cantos. But then he will introduce us to the worlds of mind and the different levels of mind. And. Uh, Many of those levels have become quite widespread in humanity. Even spiritual mind, Sri Aurobindo seems to think, is somehow an established stage in human evolution. But there's further to go. You are an optimist. <laughs> I think I have reasons to be optimistic. <laughs> Maybe in Auroville the percentage of such people is higher. We would hope so, but I can't guarantee that. No. <laughs> I, we, we wonder sometimes. <laughs> I don't want to 
what, what is special about Oroville is the opportunity we've been given. No? Rather than the achievement. Yes, sir? Uh, what are the opportunities of cosmic space? Infinite opportunities <laughs> awaiting us there. No? So is, is this all about evolution? How life evolved from a single being? Maybe a leap of we're yeah. talking about evolution here rather than what is at present, what we see at present. Is it so? Yes. Uh, what King Aswapati is doing is he's exploring the levels of existence. And what we are told at the beginning of this book is that all these levels, maybe there are 13 or 14 or many more levels, have been kaleidoscoped into matter. That's our base, our foundation. And gradually these different possibilities are evolving and expressing themselves in this world. They exist independently in their own subtle worlds. But in our world of matter, they're gradually revealing themselves in time and space and individuality. And that's what Aswapati is exploring at this point. He's looking, as I've said at the beginning, He's looking for what is that power and principle which would be able to turn this animalistic life that we, we know into a truly divine life here on earth. So let's stop there for today. All was dim sparkle on a foaming top. It whirled around a drifting shadow self on an inconscient flood of force in time. Then came the pressure of a seeing power that drew all into a dancing turbid mass circling around a single luminous point, center of reference in a conscious field, figure of a unitary light within. It lit the impulse of the half-sentient flood. Even an illusion gave of fixity, as if a sea could serve as a firm soil. That strange observing power imposed its sight. It forced on flux a limit and a shape. It gave its stream a lower narrow bank, drew lines to snare the spirit's formlessness. It fashioned the life mind of bird and beast, the answer of the reptile and the fish, the primitive pattern of the thoughts of man. A finite movement of the infinite came winging its way through a wide air of time. A march of knowledge moved in nescience and guarded in the form a separate soul. Its right to be immortal it reserved but built a wall against the siege of death and threw a hook to clutch eternity. 
a thinking entity appeared in space. A little ordered world broke into view where being had prison room for act and sight, a floor to walk, a clear but scanty range. An instrument personality was born, and a restricted, clamped intelligence consented to confine in narrow bounds its seeking. It tied the thought to visible things, prohibiting the adventure of the unseen and the soul's tread through unknown infinity. A reflex reason, nature habits glass, illumined life to know and fix its field. Accept a dangerous, ignorant brevity and the inconclusive purpose of its walk and profit by the hours precarious chance in the allotted boundaries of its fate. A little joy and knowledge satisfied this little being tied into a knot and hung on a bulge of its environment. A little curve cut off in measureless space, a little span of life in all vast time. A thought was there that planned, a will that strove, but for small aims within a narrow scope. Wasting unmeasured toil on transient things. It knew itself a creature of the mud. It asked no larger law, no loftier aim. It had no inward look, no upward gaze. A backward scholar on logic's rickety bench, indoctrinated by the erring sense, it took appearance for the face of God. For casual lights, the marching of the suns. For heaven, a starry strip of doubtful blue. Aspects of being feign to be the whole. There was a voice of busy interchange, a marketplace of trivial thoughts and acts, a life soon spent, a mind the body's slave, here seemed the brilliant crown of nature's work, and tiny egos took the world as means to sate a while dwarf lusts and brief desires. In a death-closed passage, saw life start and end as though a blind alley were creation's sign, as if for this the soul had coveted birth in the wonderland of a self-creating world and the opportunities 
of cosmic space. This creature, passionate only to survive, fettered to puny thoughts with no wide range, and to the body's needs and pangs and joys. This fire growing by its fuel's death, increased by what it seized and made its own. It gathered and grew and gave itself to none. Only it hoped for greatness in its den and pleasure and victory in small fields of power and conquest of life room for self and kin. An animal limited by its feeding space. It knew not the immortal in its house. It had no greater, deeper cause to live.